Hello everyone, how are all of you doing? Are you ready to jump in and talk about Antigone? This is the first of two lectures that will talk about the play Antigone by Sophocles. Now, we're reading three plays in the course, and for each of these three plays, we will have two lectures. The format of those lectures are the first lecture will be about characters and plot, and the second lecture will be about analysis. So today, we're going to be talking about characters and plot of Antigone, things you should have picked up on and should know about this play. So let's dive right in. First of all, in order to fully understand Antigone as a play, we need to have an understanding of the family tree of the characters involved. So that means we need to know the royal line of Thebes, since we're talking about the royal king and queen and who should be ruling Thebes. First of all, within this family tree, I want you to note that the, this relates the kings of Thebes directly to the gods Ares, Aphrodite, Zeus, and Dionysus. And then as a sub idea to understand that the two characters of Antigone and Haman were cousins and engaged. Not entirely unusual for this time period for cousins to be engaged, but definitely not unusual if you were royalty. So let's take a look at this family tree. So first of all, we have the gods Ares and Aphrodite who have the daughter Harmonia. Harmonia marries Cadmus and Harmonia and Cadmus have four children, Polyterus, Menaceus, Semele, and Agenor. Cadmus, according to myth, is the founder of Thebes. Okay, so Cadmus is the founder of Thebes. He married the daughter of two gods. His, his, so his wife Harmonia is the daughter of Ares and Aphrodite. And these two, as a couple, had four children. Now, their son, Agenor, married Europa. Their daughter, Semele, married Zeus, and they had, who is Zeus is a god, and they had Dionysus. Dionysus, who is the god, and Dionysus, as we've talked about in our, our Greek um lecture uh, essentially is like the god of love and wine and frivolity and pleasure and all that and so therefore you had the festival to Dionysus celebrating all of that and why theater was developed and performed there okay you had Menaceus, who with his wife had two children, Jocasta and Creon. We'll get to them in a little bit. And then you had Polyterus, who was the, the son. And Polyterus eventually became king of Thebes after Cadmus passes away. Polyterus and his wife have the son Labdicus who eventually becomes king of Thebes. Labdicus and his wife eventually have the son Laius, who becomes king of Thebes, and marries Jocasta. Now here's why this should be interesting. So, Menaceus, the son of Cadmus, has a daughter, Jocasta. Laius is the great grandson of Cadmus and has a daughter and, and marries Jocasta. So Cadmus's great grandson and granddaughter marry. Okay, Jocasta is, if we trace this back, is Cadmus's granddaughter. Laius, if we trace this back, is Cadmus's great grandson, and these two marry. 
All right. So somehow, some way, we got some age differences going on here. Manasseus also had the son Creon. So Jocasta and Creon are brother and sister. Now, Laius and Jocasta have one son, Oedipus. And because of what Laius and Jocasta are told when Oedipus is born, which is not a part of the story of Antigone, it's part of the story of Oedipus Rex. So this is background. Okay. The seer, the, the prophetess, the fortune teller, whatever term you want to use, tells Laius and Jocasta that their son Oedipus will be the ruin of them. And so they decide to have Oedipus killed. But ultimately, they couldn't go through with it. So Oedipus was taken out into essentially the desert to, as a baby to die on his own. Oedipus was found by a passerby and raised in another city-state. And as an adult, along the road, gets jumped by some people, but because Oedipus is going to be the strong man, he kills them. Turns out the people who jumped him on the road and that he killed, uh, one of them happens to be Laius, his father. Oedipus then enters the city of Thebes, where the Sphinx has caused famine to occur unless someone can solve the riddle of the Sphinx. And whoever solves the riddle of the Sphinx will end the horrible plight upon the people of Thebes and be crowned the new king of Thebes. Oedipus, the young man that he is, young boy even, is the one who solves the riddle. Jocasta, who was queen at the time, is now in mourning because her husband Laius has died, now marries Oedipus because, since he solved the riddle, he's named king. So in essence, Oedipus killed dad and married mom. And then... While married to mom, they had sexual relations and had four children. Eteocles, Polynices, Ismene, and Antigone. Meanwhile, Jocasta's brother Creon marries Eurydice, and they have a son, Haman, and a daughter, Majerus. Thus, Antigone and Haman are cousins. A couple things to note here. First of all, there have to be some significant age differences going on. Like I said, Laius and Jocasta were married, but Jocasta was the granddaughter and Laius was the great grandson of Cadmus. So somehow, some way, there's some age difference here. There's definitely an age difference between Jocasta and Oedipus. And even if we're conservative to say uh, 16 years, which is sick, let's say 20 years, it's still sick because they're mother and son. But they don't know it. However, by the end of the play of Oedipus Rex, they come to discover that. Um, you know, there's, there's an age difference there. But these two have four kids, Eteocles, Polynices, Ismene, and Antigone. Eteocles and Polynices are two brothers, Ismene and Antigone are two daughters. Now, these four kids not only are sons to Oedipus, but technically Oedipus is their half-brother. Okay. Jocasta is not only 
their mother, but technically through Oedipus, their grandmother. Okay, so Jocasta, so through Jocasta, she's their mother. Through Oedipus, she's their grandmother. Make sense? But also, in their relationship to Oedipus, they're also, you know, technically not only Oedipus's children, but they're his half-siblings, half-brothers and half-sisters. And Creon is their uncle through Jocasta, or their great-uncle through Oedipus. It's a sick family tree. But this is the background you need to know for the story. All right, so here are our characters. Antigone is, of course, the protagonist. She's Oedipus' daughter, Haman's fiance, Ismene's sister. She is a rebel. She's brave. She's a free spirit. She's loyal, and she's family-oriented. That's all that I've got. I don't know what you think, but that's what I think. Ismene is a rule follower, and she's Antigone's sister. And at first, throughout the plot, she opposes Antigone and what Antigone wants to do. Polynices is a brother. He is considered by Creon and the city-state and the people of Thebes to be a traitor. Burying Polynices is the focus of the story. Eteocles is considered to be the noble brother who fights for Thebes. Eteocles had a proper burial, and he was respected, whereas Polynices was not respected. Creon is the uncle. He's Oedipus's brother-in-law, as Jocasta's brother. He's also Oedipus's uncle because she's Jocasta's brother. He becomes king after Polynices and Antiochus die. He enforces the burial law. He is the main antagonist of the story. He's Haman's father. Haman is Creon's son, Antigone's cousin and fiancé, and is a man who completely and totally and fully supports Antigone. He is her number one backer. Eurydice is Creon's wife, and by the end of the play, you'll see she becomes devastated by Haman's death and kills herself. She's not in the story a lot. So exposition. Remember, when we talked about plot, exposition Defines the point of attack, gives the backstory, and provides information. So first of all, before the play even starts, this is what's occurred. I gave you the family tree. You need to know the family tree in order to understand what's, what's going on. Before the play started, Polynices and Antiochus kill each other. Here's what had happened. At the end of the play Oedipus Rex, Jocasta has killed herself. Oedipus has gouged out his eyes and has gone off to the desert. Presumably he'll die, but he's blinded himself because he realizes that he has killed his father, married his mother, had sex with her, and had four kids. So he has given up the throne. So, with Oedipus at the end of Oedipus Rex giving up the throne, before the play Antigone occurs, Polynices and Antiochus, the two brothers, had agreed to alternate years ruling Thebes. Well, Antiochus was in power. 
Polit and his year was up. Polinices comes in and says, all right, bro, your year's up. Time for you to give it to me for the next year. I'll keep everything going. Don't worry. And we'll continue to alternate. Well, Antiochus backed out of the deal and refused. In other words, to use a, a term from playing cards, he reneged. Okay? Polinices is upset. So these two get in a fight. They war with each other. But because Eteocles at the time was the king and Polinices wasn't, Polinices is considered to be a traitor. Eteocles is considered to be respectful and honorable because he's representing Thebes. And they kill each other. Okay? Keep in mind, all of this started because Daddy also happens to be their big brother, and Mommy also happened to be Grandma. So they had family issues going back even before this began. After they kill one another, because Eteocles was at the time the king of Thebes, he is given an honorable burial. And because Polynices was thought to be a traitor, even though, I mean, it's, it's, talk about drama, even though he dies because his brother lied to him and backed out of the deal they had, Polynices is, is th this traitor. It's, it, it's like he's treasonous. He's just laying out there in the desert, in the dirt, waiting for the vultures to come pick his body. And their uncle, Creon, is already named king. So, late point of attack. Now, keep in mind, everything I just told you is backstory. Everything I've just told you happened before the play starts. So we do not see Eteocles and Polynices fight each other. We do not see them kill each other. We do not see Creon become king. We do not see Eteocles be buried. We do not see any of this. This all happened before the play started. It is a late point of attack, and I put it to you. Late point of attack, does that mean climactic or episodic? Okay. So the inciting incident. Inciting incident sets up the initial conflict. So all of this happened before the play started. So the play hasn't even begun yet. So what is starting the conflict? Well, as the play starts... Creon, who's now king, makes a proclamation that Eteocles was to be honored and given a proper, you know, honorable king's burial, and Polynices is not to be buried. He should not be honored in any way. And that any person who publicly honors Polynices will be executed. Okay, so Creon's proclamation sets the plot in motion. Without this proclamation, no story exists. Antigone wouldn't have anything to be upset about. So here's rising action. This is, if you'll recall, the series of obstacles and complications and new conflicts that characters encounter and have to overcome. First of all, Antigone tells Esmene, they need to do something to honor their brother, Polynices. And Ismene says, no, I'm not going to be executed. Now, keep in mind, to honor Polynices is very simple. All Antigone wants to do is sprinkle some dirt over him and say a prayer. She, if she does that, she is copacetic. She's happy. She feels she's... She's honored her brother, honored his memory, all of that. You know, 
we don't know how she feels about Atiocles and the fact that he went back on his word and, you know, the two brothers killed each other. We don't know that. So, Ismene says no. And Antigone's like, well, you know, screw you. I'll go do it myself anyway. I just, like I said, all I got to do is sprinkle some dirt and say a prayer. Because Crean had put this proclamation out, he's had guards guarding Linus's body to make sure that no one honored it. Well, guess what? A guard who informs Crayon that someone tried to bury Polynices, that someone tried to honor him. The guard sees Antigone sprinkle dirt on the body. And then Antigone and Creon argue over Polynices. And what Antigone argues is that to go against the law of man is not to go against the law of the gods. Because it was Creon's law that Polynices should not be honored. But the law of the gods, according to Antigone, is that he was a human being and deserves respect even in death. Haman respects his father, but he hears the people of Thebes who support Antigone. The people of Thebes do not agree with Creon's law. They want Polynices mourned. They're not stupid. They know why he died. They know who he was. They know he was not a traitor. They know he was not treasonous. They want him mourned. They want him respected. Creon, because of his ego, probably for no other reason, refuses to listen to the people. Politically, I'm sure we've experienced things like that, where politically our leaders have not listened to the people. Okay? So, since Creon refuses to back down, because keep in mind, he's king, and if he backs down to Antigone, he's admitting that he made an error with his law. If he backs down to the people of Thebes and allows for Polynices to be honored and buried, he's admitting he screwed up. So that ultimately means that according to the law, Antigone has to die. Well, his son Haman steps up and says, she won't die alone then. So our crisis. The action of play that takes an important critical turn of confrontation. The crisis is that Antigone defied that proclamation in the guards' report to Creon. You know, there is this back and forth with Ismene. She argues with Creon. Ultimately, you know, she buries her brother. She prays over him. And she's, you know... I don't want to say snitched on, but you know, she's reported on. And Creon, therefore, declares that she should die. That's probably the ultimate crisis. Now our climax, recognition and reversal. Remember I told you, climax is, depends upon R&R, &R, recognition and reversal. A character has to recognize and reverse action. In this play, I would say there's two possibilities exist for who experiences recognition reversal. Of these two possibilities, only one's the right choice. If you recall from my lecture about plot, I told you that more than 90% of the time, the climax is experienced by the protagonist. But the antagonist could possibly 
experience the climax. And by experience the climax, I mean experiencing recognition and reversal. So there are, Antigone and Creon are two possibilities here, our protagonist and our antagonist. So does Creon have recognition and reversal? Well, Creon recognizes eventually his law is wrong, even though he has sent Antigone off to this cave. But he unsuccessfully attempts to reverse his actions and his decisions because Antigone has already hung herself. So although Creon has a sense of recognition, he does not get reversal. Therefore, the character who experiences the climax the character who experiences recognition and reversal is Antigone. She hangs herself to be in control. The gods have ordained this to happen as far as she is concerned. In other words, Antigone recognizes that she was right to defy the proclamation, to honor her brother Polynices by burying him and praying over him. And she reverses her position. And by reversing her position, she no longer is going to be combative with Creon. She reverses to choose to accept her fate. Thus, Antigone experiences both recognition and reversal. Now the following action, the denouement, the winding down of the play. There's a prophet who tells Creon that he will be punished and doomed for life. And Haman dies. And Eurydice, Haman's mother, Creon's wife, kills herself with knitting needles cursing Creon for Haman's death. So following Antigone's suicide of hanging herself, Haman keeps his word when he tells his father early on in the play, if you sentence her, she will not die alone. And because of his love for her, his commitment to her, his support of her. He died with her. And his mother, furious at Creon, also takes her life. So, the resolution, the end of the story, conflicts are resolved for good or for bad. Well, yeah, the conflicts are resolved here. Creon attempts to bury Polynices in the end. And he is all alone. Completely all alone. I mean, technically, although not really a part of the story anymore, Ismene is still alive. But let's think about this. Creon's sister Jocasta is dead. Jocasta's husband, Laos, has been dead for years. Jocasta's husband's son, Oedipus, blinded himself, went out to the desert, and is probably dead. His nephews, Teocles and Polynices, are dead. His niece, Antigone, is dead. His wife, Eurydice, is dead. His son, Haman, is dead. His niece, Ismene, we presume is still alive, but nothing is said about her in the end. So ultimately, Creon is all alone. And it is suggested that the moral of the play is that there is no escape
for man what awaits man in life, that man will suffer. And I use the term man here as is the concept of that period in time to represent all people. I am not specifically referring to one gender. So when I use the term man, I am using it in reference to how it was used at the when the play was written. The concept is, is that there is no escape for us, that we will all suffer in some way, shape, or form. I don't know if you agree with that, but that is how many surmise the lesson of Antigone. I would ask you, what are your thoughts about that? What do you think is the lesson? Now, for our next lecture, I want you to research and attempt to have an understanding of feminist literary criticism. If you go back to our review versus criticism lecture, I taught you that there are 10 ways in which we can analyze literature and therefore art and therefore theater. Of those, one of them is feminist literary criticism. In order to create a focus for the course, we are going to use feminist literary criticism to look at all three plays. So we're going to use it with Antigone, we're going to use it with Emperor of the Moon, and we're going to use it with Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. Number one, we're doing so because I want to clear up any misconceptions you might have about what feminist literary criticism is because this is separate from what it means to be a feminist or what feminism is. All right? Two, it's an unexpected form to use with these three plays across the board. Uh, it could potentially be expected with Antigone, maybe, uh, but the history archetypal or the formal approaches might be, or the philosophical approaches might be more expected with these three plays. Okay? So we'll use this perspective in order to try and keep you focused for the course. To that effect, here's a paragraph about feminist literary criticism taken from the book A Handbook of Critical Approaches to Literature, 5th edition, pages 222-223. Indeed, feminism has often focused upon what is absent rather than what is present reflecting concern with the silencing and marginalization of women in a patriarchal culture, a culture organized in favor of men. Feminism is an overtly political approach and can attack other approaches for their false assumptions about women. As Judith Federley has bluntly pointed out, literature is political and its politics is male. When we read the canon of what is currently considered classic American literature, we perforce identify as male. The thesis that men write about women to find out more about men has had long-lasting implications, especially the idea that man defines the human, not woman. Now, I am not taking any political stance here. We are simply going to be looking at analyzing this play through the feminist literary lens. That's all it means. I don't care what's being said on social media. I don't care what your stance is. I'm saying instead of using the moral philosophical approach, instead of using the historical approach, instead of using the formal approach or the archetypal approach, or the structuralist approach. We are going to use this lens. That's all. You need to educate yourself in advance of the next lecture. Not about feminism, but about 
feminist literary criticism. Okay? There's a difference. Keep that in mind. All right. Make sure you read the play. This should have just reinforced what you learned about the play while reading it. Until next time, take care, everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Have a great day.